Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. Our topic today is modernizing mental health benefits. And um, just for context, mental health benefits is actually the number one strategic focus of employers, accor according to our most recent survey of employer-sponsored health plans. I've invited Carrie Bergen to join me today. She is a principal in our mental health specialty group. She's based in California. Welcome, Carrie. Thanks so much for having me, Tracy. So Carrie and I recently caught up with Mary Kay Gahuli, who is the Director of Wellbeing at Adobe in San Francisco, and we wanted to share a few clips from our conversation as we explore this topic of modernizing mental health benefits. So let's first start with just a quick overview of the Adobe philosophy. Think about emotional well-being. We think about it in a kind of a, a global ecosystem, um, essentially a full spectrum of um, emotional and mental support for our employees, um, starting with prevention and early intervention to support treatment and then resilience. Um, we, we feel like it's very important to have um, the right support and treatment through our, our third party vendors um, but what's even more important is to have that strong culture and ecosystem for those point solutions or those programs to thrive. So it's not for us about adding something that's, that's, that's you know, top of mind or on, on the market. Um, we want to make sure that it has a place to live and is really embedded within our culture. So that is, is core to how we think about the whole, the whole continuum. We want to make sure that when um, employees step into that ecosystem, um, that they have kind of a pathway in order to get the, the support that they need um, from an early stage um, and or if they need more, um, more clinical help and then on, on the back end support for them ongoing. So Carrie, you know, I thought what Mary Kay had to say was really interesting. Can you just shed maybe a little bit more light on the importance of strategy aligning with a employer's culture? Yeah, absolutely, Tracy. You know, building a strategy that aligns with the culture is key to having any type of positive impact. And I really feel that the buy-in and support from leadership um, is key and crucial to that happening because once that happens, we start to see that this trickle-down effect, if you will, um, where employees start to feel more comfortable and confident talking about mental health, and they're more likely to understand the resources available to them. And I also love that Mary Kay said Adobe is thinking about emotional well-being as a continuum because when we think about mental health strategy, the solution or the program shouldn't be a, a band-aid approach. It really needs to address the full spectrum of needs from stress reduction, like Mary Kay was talking about, and resiliency to building a, a treatment recovery support that can then engage all employees and not just hit certain parts of the population. And I also think with, with mental health strategy, as we talk about it, it needs to be weaved into daily discussions. We don't want to see a mental health program that's only promoted during open enrollment and then we never hear about it again, but making regular effective communications part of that strategy is going to generate a greater return on the organization's uh, investment. And you know, something that we're seeing more and more organizations do is really have dedicated content. Um, so if their population is struggling with substance use disorder or um, child and adolescent claim spend is higher, having communications that focus on those populations specifically to help people understand what's available to them. Weaved in with manager training, um, fireside chats, we're seeing a lot of that polling opportunities, but really having a, a strategy that includes continuous evaluation of the needs to determine what the employees um, are seeking and what's going to be best to support them is key. 
Yeah, you know, I just think it's so interesting. You know, so many employers um, had the pandemic as a triggering effect for them to focus on mental health benefits. But, you know, Adobe's been working on their emotional well being program for about five years, which I thought was interesting. So clearly they started before the pandemic. So we asked Mary Kay to describe if there was like a defining moment when they knew that they needed to do something different. And this is what she had to say. We looked at our data and the data wasn't telling us what we needed to know. Um, so we worked with our, our vendors to see how we could improve the experience. And, and the three things that were top of mind for us was access to care, quality, and the employee experience. And so that's where our journey began. Um, we took a, an inventory of, of what we had and um, we looked to make improvements. And at the same time, the market was changing. So we spent a lot of time looking at the market, working with our current vendor, and then exploring what, um, what might resonate with our employees and might, what might fit with our culture. So Carrie, it seems like the situation that Mary Kay describes probably resonates with many of our clients, with many employers. And she mentions that the market is changing. I would love to know from you, what is going on with mental health benefits and specifically EAPs? I keep hearing this comment that we need to reimagine the EAP experience. Yeah, I, I hear that a lot too. And I also hear the question around, what does that mean? And I think you know the traditional EAP vendors that that have been in place um, for for a long time um, offer great services. They really do. But with the pandemic and what started to occur, we've seen this need uh, for mental health services emerge in a way that we really haven't before. And I think there's three key areas that these reimagined EAPs and a lot of the traditional EAPs as well are really focused on and trying to meet the needs of employees and members. And the first one is access to care. And we hear all the time that people are trying to get in to see a mental health provider and maybe the, the providers aren't taking new patients or um, they're not calling back. Um, they're, they're no longer in service. And so where we've seen larger networks that are far reaching before, we're seeing these reimagined EAPs that are really trying to develop curated networks so that they can assess the availability of the providers and make sure that if they're referring someone to them, they're available for that, that care that's needed. And we're also seeing access points uh, change quite a bit. So historically, there was telephonic intake where somebody would have to spend time in their day calling up the EAP number, that 800 number. They'd get maybe a list of providers. They'd have to then go and call them. Now we're seeing organizations offering online assessment. They're using clinically validated tools to assess what that clinical need is, and then also offering online scheduling to those providers. So they know right away they have an appointment um, with a provider that they've been matched to based on that clinical need and their preference. And then we're also seeing a big push like we are within, I think, all of health and wellness for virtual treatment. So as we know, COVID, you know, required us to, to stay at home and change the way that, that um, we operated really. And so there's been a, a big increase in virtual treatment and improvement in that backend technology. Um, and so the other area I think that, that um, aligns with access is also the clinical focus with the option for longer term support where needed. So instead of getting three EAP sessions for that short-term care, we're now seeing the reimagined EAPs, if you will, offering much more um, lengthy amount of time with the provider. So maybe 10 sessions is something we see quite frequently, um, up to 25 even. And, and what a lot of um, the vendors have done is, and what we've seen some of these innovative or reimagined EAPs do is also partner with the health plans. So they're augmenting the health plans medical network of behavioral health providers um, to add additional providers that are offering quality clinical care. And so what individuals can do is start within the EAP and then have a seamless transition into that health plan integration where the, the member cost sharing would kick in, but they can have that ongoing care if their issue wasn't resolved within the EAP sessions. So instead of it being 
as I mentioned before, kind of this Band-Aid approach, it's really trying to address the continuum of care and get, get people in with the right level of care. So therapy, there's also coaching that's available now for a lot of folks. Um, and then the second piece of that would be quality. So I talked about the networks with the traditional EAP vendors having tended to be more broad in general. Um, what the innovative or reimagined EAPs are doing is really trying to build a network where they're verifying that their providers are offering only evidence-based treatment. And what we see with that happening is their ability to report on clinical outcomes and showing the improvement about you know, how people are doing in care. So they're not just referred to a therapist, they're actually improving their symptoms and, and resolving their clinical issues. Um, and with that comes improved reporting so that we can understand what's happening there. And then the last piece of, of the reimagined EAPs that I think is um, important to mention is the employee experience. Are the benefits easy to learn about? Can people understand how to navigate them? Is there follow-up? You know, or is, is somebody just being referred and then, you know, they, they don't get the care, they don't like their therapist, but there's no follow up, which can allow the member to fall through the cracks. And so we're seeing more of this closed circle from start to finish um, through the reimagined EAPs. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I do think that the employee experience is just key. Um, when you talked about quality, you mentioned, you know, that data is important, getting that, that outcome data. And um, we asked Mary Kay about the importance of data. And this is what she had to say about digging into the data to really understand employee engagement and the employee experience. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we're we're in the infancy stages of our data collection, but when we were receiving reports that from our prior vendor that just talked about um, participation or talked about engagement, um, and we didn't really know what was behind that, that number or, or what that meant, um, that's where we wanted to, to dig deep. What does that mean? Does that mean that somebody has clicked on our website, um, engaged with a coach, had a question. It, it just felt very, very murky. And so for us, we really wanted to understand um, all those things are important, but we want to make sure that we are separating those out so that we can see are people getting the help that they need um, or are they just being referred to um, another resource? Um, our, our reporting now is really able, we're really able to see that an individual has made an appointment with a therapist, and we can also tell, um, you know, if those employees actually had that appointment, and then if there was feedback after. So, um, so that's just the, the early kind of simple stage that we're at is like really just understanding what is, what is engagement, what does participation mean from these programs. So Carrie, one of the things that I think would be really helpful, um, would you suggest a framework or will you just run through maybe the types and sources of data that plan sponsors should be collecting specific to mental health services? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a great question. When we think about traditionally what's been collected, we we hear things like client satisfaction, absenteeism, productivity, productivity, excuse me, which are all great to understand, but now we're seeing this push and, and a need to see things like wait times for care. So I was talking about the, the movement from calling in versus going online to see a provider and, and get their scheduling, actually measuring what's the turnaround to get into care with that provider and seeing that within the reporting. And then also the clinical outcomes improvement that I had talked about. So are people just going to see a therapist and then maybe they're dropping out or are they actually accomplishing what the goal of therapy is and that is to resolve those issues. And with those things, we're starting to see the, the vendors be able to report on return on investment. Mm -hmm. um, so data that's really telling about our story about what, what's happening in therapy, what's happening for those, those individuals that are going. And with that data, we're able to then really drive strategy so that 
um, we're able to tell is, is there a trend? Is there a communication that needs to go on so that we can promote the service because, you know, alcohol use is really high for this organization's population. Um, and, and, I, and I also think that because of COVID and the delayed access to care, we saw a lot of people who were waiting to get care and their symptoms exasperated. And then they started going, they, they bypassed outpatient and were going to a higher level of care. And so taking a look at what is the impact on the health plan spend? How do those two function together from an EAP, either traditional or reimagined vendor? And then who's going into the medical plan with the member cost sharing? Um, being activated and and what does that look like as well? So I, I think there's there's a need now for much more granular and detailed data so that people can use that to continuously drive their emotional well-being strategy. So we used to say we'd put together a, a short-term and a long-term roadmap and the short-term roadmap would be around a year and the long-term roadmap would maybe be three or even five years. And now because of the capabilities of these vendors and what they're continuously doing to improve their services and offerings, we're looking at six months to a year as a roadmap and then year two, maybe year three. And so continuously monitoring that baseline of data and then seeing how, how the program can grow, what the vendor can do as your strategic partner um, to really grow with you is key so that they're keeping up with, with your population, they're anticipating the needs and they're making those recommendations for the organization based on the data and what that story is telling. So it sounds like a lot more active management of the mental health benefits program, you know, continuously looking at the data, correcting as needed, not just doing this once a year when you go through your renewal process or, yeah, you know, right. whatever your timing might be. Um, you know, to wrap things up, um, let's share Mary Kay's advice to employers that are just getting started on their behavioral health journey. I think this will be really helpful. So, so let's take a listen. Um, I think that the biggest piece of advice is um, to really listen to your employees. Um, they are your end, uh, your customer, and they're there to, um, to tell you how you're doing. So that would be the first thing. Um, the second thing is that there's really no silver bullet. And even if you are going to go with a new vendor or, or try out a new solution, it's got to fit into um, a bigger solution, a bigger ecosystem and fit with your culture. Um, I would love that to say that, you know, if you implement a vendor, then everything's going to be fine, but there's not. <laughs> you need to have, um, you know, training for your managers, training for your employees. It needs to resonate uh, with your culture. You need to continue to um, promote it. And then also um, continue to have a, a relationship with that vendor so they really understand your culture and what you're trying to drive. Wow, so Carrie, do you have anything to add to Mary Kay's advice? You know, I love what Mary Kay said about there not being a silver bullet because there, there really isn't and there's not one end all be all. It takes the organization and the leadership to embrace and promote the culture of emotional well-being, make it acceptable to talk about mental health, for people to reach out for those resources and, and feel comfortable. Um, I had a client once tell me that they wanted mental health services to be talked about in the same way that yoga was. So I'm going to, I'm going to my therapist tonight, I'm going to yoga tonight. And I, I think that um, if we ever got to that point, that would be wonderful. Um, but, but not only is the culture important, but it's the strong communication with the vendors as well and really making your expectations clear and then having that continued alignment. And I, and I say it's a, a vendor partner because it is truly a partnership. It takes the organization and the culture shift as well as the strong vendor that can keep up with, with the organization and really continue to support to make sure that those needs are being met. Oh, gosh, such good advice from both you um, and Mary Kay. Thank you both for being a part of this segment. Lots of great advice on how employers can modernize their mental health benefits. So um, thank you for joining and we'll see you next time.